Okay, looks like uh, we're good to start this webinar. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. We are thrilled to see so many of you connected to our webinar today. Today's session is the fourth and unfortunately last one of a series of UN System Staff College Coffee Hour webinars on climate security as part of the Berlin Climate Security Conference in partnership with Adelphi. In previous webinars, we highlighted the role of climate-related risks uh, that they could play in exacerbating conflict dynamics, converging with other shocks and pressures to threaten stability of states and societies. Today, we will explore challenges and opportunities posed by climate risks to peacemaking. Why is it important to address climate change considerations into wider peace processes? and reconstruction space for sustainable and I would say inclusive peace? And when is it most appropriate to include them and when not? So I have the pleasure to be joined in our discussions today by Julie Rasten, who is program officer uh, for, from the European Peace Institute and also one of the, author, the authors of the Making Peace with the Climate Report that is soon to be coming out. Also, uh, today we have with us Kulmiya Mohamed, who is the political affairs officer with the Mediation Support Unit of the Department of, Peace, of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs in New York. We also have Gideon Bloomberg, who is the director of Eco Peace Middle East. Um, there will be a chance throughout uh, the, the webinar for you to ask questions to the chat box at the bottom of the Zoom page but also um, our panelists will address all of, your, all of your questions at the end in the last 30 minutes. For those of you who are not camera shy, also there will be an opportunity to turn on your camera and ask your question live uh, uh, by raising your hands. Um, if you look at the participant um, icon, you can, uh, you can click that, uh, that raise hands function um, through that tool. And now, without further ado, uh, Julie, please, the floor is yours, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ginevra. Can, uh, can you hear me? If we can, loud and clear. Yes, perfect. So, hello, everybody. Good morning, good day, and good afternoon. Um, thank you for the, for the introduction and for arranging this coffee hour. I'm very happy to be here today speaking alongside Kumi and Mohammed and Gidon Bromberg. My name is Julia Rostein and I work with the European Institute of Peace. And what we want to do is put climate change on the agenda in conflict resolution because we believe it matters quite centrally to a sustainable peace. And what we started out doing was having consultations with senior UN, EU and NGO envoys and mediators on how they think climate change matters to conflict resolution. And so as uh, Shinera just said, there's a paper coming out of that which will be published very soon. And I'll be sharing some insights with you today. So what I'll do for uh, this coffee hour is to give you a bit of a flyover and present four key messages uh, from that. So first, Climate change matters to mediators because it matters to conflict. And when I say mediators, I mean the wider group of people facilitating peace processes, that being envoys, heads of missions, NGO representatives, and local peace builders. So addressing climate change in conflict will be a highly political task. And that's exactly why a mediator skill set is needed. They'll be needed to ensure that climate change is actually integrated in processes when relevant to solving the conflict and to ensure that when doing so, it fits into the wider political machinery of conflict resolution. So dealing with climate change is a new task we're trying to get a grasp of, but mediators have been dealing with related environmental issues for a long time. And what's new about climate change is the increasing unpredictability and the decrease, decreasing of the pie of things there will be to share and to build agreements over. But a lesson here actually coming from, from several of these 
mediators is that this challenge is exactly where the opportunity or where an opportunity can arise, namely because climate change is a shared challenge and can be framed in this way. And these can be powerful narratives. Can we increase the pie if we address climate change? Are there technical steps we can take to create a shared future with more resources? Mediators will need to help conflict parties answer these questions and imagine the future scenarios. So that's one thing. The second point is that for mediators to be able to do so, we need to enhance our analysis. And part of that starts with understanding the pathways through which climate change impacts on conflict and an overarching message coming out of, of, our, uh, of our interviews is that these pathways are very hard to pin down. And it is so for several reasons. First, it's quite difficult to separate some climate change impacts from other environmental issues. Mediators have been dealing with environmental and natural resource issues for many decades, and they need to know how and if the responses to climate change should be different while at the same time also drawing on the lessons learned from dealing with environment and natural resources in conflict. And then secondly, even if we know how climate change impacts and responses differ, it's difficult to measure how climate change then interact with other conflict factors. So for example, if there's a severe lack of water, what is caused by drought? What's caused by poverty, marginalization and poor management or governance? So a realization is that we need to enhance our analyses on climate, and this needs to be done in a way that's inclusive and integrated with other agendas, notably the political economy or with gender analysis. And a third and related point to this is that we need to integrate technical and scientific climate solutions in conflict resolution. The mediator's task, as always when, when introducing uh, technical knowledge and, and solutions, is to ensure that this is used in a context appropriate manner and introduced timely. The mediator is not the climate expert, but needs to be able to translate expertise to conflict parties in a process. And taking up this role, to take up this role, the mediator needs a level of knowledge about climate change impacts and what responses exist. An important side point to remember to this is, and, and this is something many mediators mentioned, and it, it's not a new thing, frankly, is that there is a need for this analysis to be accessible. The mediator may most likely not have the time to sit down and read a hundred page guide on climate change impact and conflict, but could benefit from intro training and trusted experts around them during the process. So it will be necessary to decide how to boast mediation teams, either by strengthening the capacity of their own offices, drawing on expertise elsewhere in their own institutions, or working in partnership with others that have the capacity to, uh, to support them. And this will be most effectively achieved if it's a collective effort. It's a collective effort of the mediator on the ground, as well as within international organizations, track two organizations, the mediation support community, from the outset and throughout assignments. And the last point uh, I want to share with you just now is that to make all of this happen, it requires that we keep climate change high on the political agenda because practitioners will not be able to address climate change in peace processes. The mediators will not be able to address climate change in peace processes if it is not financially and politically supported. So therefore, the task is for the whole conflict resolution community, uh, which is closely linked to the geopolitical fault lines of addressing climate change as a whole as well. So while there's been resistance to the climate security agenda on the international level, many states, on the other hand, are continuing to advance the agenda on, on this highest political level, but also in their own, their own countries. Um, and these are important partners for the conflict resolution actors who should continue supporting them in policy, in innovating and showcasing approaches and providing arguments for why this is not just a necessary task, but a really, really good idea 
with many opportunities for an inclusive and sustainable peace. So that was a, a very brief flyover of some of the points coming out of our reports. Um, I look forward to hearing Kulmi and Gidon adding more granularity to this topic and to discussing with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, for this uh, very, very uh, short and sweet presentation, but uh, nevertheless, uh, very interesting uh, to the point. Um, and uh, I think uh, there is a thread that's run across all of our uh, webinar, Coffee Hour webinar series, uh, which is really to look um, at the um, at the climate security aspect from a sustaining peace point of view, uh, where the center is to support the political pillar uh, but also what even uh, what emerges clearly also from uh, your report, which I do recommend all participants to to read when it becomes available to the public, is really to look at the issue of um, climate security uh, in, and mediation and focus on the opportunities that uh, that uh, these processes can provide uh, to practitioners, but also to the local communities and most importantly to the local communities with a view, as you said, to, to be as inclusive as possible and uh, increase uh, the pie. So I would like now to leave the floor to Kulmie, who can give us also a, a perspective uh, from uh, from uh, the, the, the office, uh, the UN um, Department of uh, Peace Building and Political Affairs. Um, Kulmia, the floor is yours. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ginevra. Just to, in a way, underscore that my uh, vantage comes from, in a way, a practitioner's point of view. Uh, I work on, I receive mediation support in the Africa region within the Mediation Support Unit and have worked in various uh, mediation support roles in, uh, in, from Sudan, South Sudan, Liberia, uh, Syria, and, and so forth. So this really is from the vantage of the political end of the spectrum rather than the sort of uh, the, the other end or in that sense. I think what is really useful um, is to, in a sense, start with the, the premise. The premise is that Secretary General has really recognized climate security issues to be really a threat multiplier. It's at the core of our, and it has to be at the core of our understanding of the fact that it, it exacerbates pre-existing inequalities and fault lines, it enhances marginalization and, and, and really reinforces exclusion and other sort of pre-existing threats that already exist. And therefore, and he has been very clear, is really very much an international sort of a, a potential threat to international peace and security unless addressed. Uh, last year, as part of that sort of prioritization that has been happening within the UN, the Secretary General uh, um, underscored the complexities of climate security related risks in what he what, what is the, his governing body, the executive, executive committee, and requested that the UN address these risks through a UN approach on prevention and sustaining peace. This really then requires translating this call into sort of increasing the UN's capabilities to understand the complex interplay between environmental drivers of peace and security. This also means really implementation of best practice environmental solutions to ensure that the emerging risks are addressed before they degenerate really into, into crisis. Within the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs, there's been an innovative, innovative new uh, unit that has been created jointly with UNDP and UNEP called the Climate Security Mechanism. Uh, this is really to establish, you know, to strengthen the capacity of the UN system to systemically better address these issues and really focus on uh, you know, the field and UN entities to really integrate these considerations and climate security risk into analysis, into planning, into programming. Um, as I said, really our focus uh, and, and stance on this is really through the lens of prevention and the sustaining peace agenda. Our prevention platforms on the ground, whether they are our regional offices in places like you know us in West Africa, whether they are Central Asia in our offices in Central Asia, uh, regional sort of envoys are increasingly being tasked to look into these issues as part of their conflict prevention agenda. This means that when they come up with, for example, a prevention strategy for the region, these issues have to be integrated, there has to be analytics there, there has to be a core understanding of what can be done and what is, where, where it's a space for work in a sense in that, in, in that regard. As uh, Julie put that, the importance of partnerships is absolutely critical. We're not in this alone. We, there are a number of different actors and vested interests who are at play, whether these are the regional organizations or sub-regional bodies, 
uh, whether it's member states uh, who are on the front line of some of this work. And in many of these actually situations, not only if you look at places like the Pacific, but also in the African region, it's the African regions of in, in West Africa who've really come up with cooperative arrangements around sharing of resources and whatnot to really uh, advance on this issue. But of course, it's also an understanding of the private sector, something that we're not very good at really doing as institutions, you know, and trying to be much more sort of linking into one of the, those innovative approaches that, that exist there. The second part now I really would really like to look at is really about the opportunities provided by mediation processes to, to in a way support climate action and climate change. So in a sense, we also have to be very clear what we mean by mediation. Uh, the UN has a very defined concept of mediation in terms of it being a structured approach, uh, it's based on the consent of the parties. It's really with, with a view to reaching a specific agreement. But when we talk about this issue of climate action and, uh, and climate security, we're talking about using the sort of much more expansive you know, understanding of that, which means the good officer's role of the Secretary General, which is provided for under Article 33. It's about uh, the good officers of his envoys. It's about the facilitation uh, work that we have at our disposal. It's about preventative diplomacy and the deployment of really good officers to try and mitigate, stop, and resolve those conflicts where they exist, in, in, in a sense. Um, we have often come to this issue. The core phase of it has been really around the natural resources, because it's manifested in the context of natural resources and the work that we do. What does this mean, for example, in the context of land, when there is a, for example, increasing, you know, uh, less arable land available and competition and, uh, over that available land? What does it mean in the context of extractives, you know, uh, when there's uh, overexploitation of oil and whatnot? What does it mean in terms of water, where, for example, uh, increasing desertification is, is resulting in less availability of water, or in terms of transboundary water sharing issues and whatnot? But it's really about really understanding what, that way that there can be a conflict driver in terms of whether it's about ownership, whether it's about access, whether it's about decision making, uh, or, even, or a distribution of benefits and, and shared burdens or not. What we are seeing is an increasing, in, uh, and this is really positive, inclusion of, of, of climate issues and climate security related issues into both peace agreements, but also in the Security Council's work. For example, the new mission that's going to be looking at Sudan, the Peace Support Mission UNITAM, which is going to start in January of 2021, has an emphasis on climate uh, action. This is this is to be applauded, and this is very this is very new. We have seen over the past uh, sort of 60 years about 40 to 60 percent of, of peace agreements have had some sort of reference to natural resources issues. For example, this is positive and bodes well for. Uh, building the space for including additional uh, sort of uh, indicators and, and work around climate, climate action. In a sense, the characteristics of this uh, is very unique and provides difficulties for the mediation sphere because often in many ways, um, they, uh, these issues are seen to be either highly technical, therefore because the, the scientific data is very complex and, and often very uh, hard to grapple for, for many sort of generalists. Uh, there is uncertainty over the data or, um, in a sense, uh, there's also a lot of vested interests, and sort of it could be culturally specific, you know, culturally important for for, for, for many. But there, we, but there are opportunities and opportunities for uh, engaging and including them in sort of uh, looking at these issues from a, a peace agreement point of view. Um, so, what, um, for example, you can address these issues in a manner consistent with the role of the conflict, because each of these conflicts are different. So what we do, for example, in Syria is going to be what we're trying to do for a transition situation in Sudan or vice versa in a place where there's a proliferation of non-state armed groups and so forth. We can use the potential benefits and the discussion around benefits as an incentive to really keep the parties at the table and, and by focusing on that. We can establish mechanisms or institutions to address these issues also in the future because often the, the mediator is grappling with uh, a, a geometry of needs and priorities. So in a sense, sometimes you may not wish to even resolve the, the issue at, at stake immediately, but create a uh, sort of a structure that allows it to be uh, addressed as, as part of an ongoing governance uh, in, in, the, in the future. You also design appropriate wealth sharing and benefit sharing provisions. You can also establish a technical subtract, which really looks at some of these issues and allows it to be sort of uh, kept at the, at, the, at the political forefront in terms of the consultation and the dialogue process. I think a couple of takeaways. Um, mediation should really aim for collaboration over the shared benefits, which can generate the trust that is really needed to tackle the other issues. Because really often what we are dealing with is a deficiency of trust and the ability to provide, you know, to gain space into, into the political sphere. 
And there are the second issue is really there are several mediation techniques that are available to overcome you know entrenched positions, and we have to think and be innovative in the way we use those different tools. Often the focus is on track one, but really about focusing on the subnational work, about our ability to really uh, you know use the geometry that is that is available to us, and really as I said, laying the foundation for future reports. A couple of final comments before I hand back because I know we're short on time. There are also the challenges to mediation right now. Let's be honest, uh, the, the, we, the, the political space is more divided than it has ever been. This has manifested, for example, in the Security Council, uh, where it's been incredibly difficult to really uh, build convergence on a lot of the issues that we need to work on. The threats to multilateralism and the multilateralism and the whole of the multilateral approach is that the increasing fragmentation that we're seeing amongst the parties uh, and amongst leadership on the ground. So that inability to be able to distinguish our entry points is, is also very, very, very clear. And also this focus really on, on track one, what we call high powered mediation has often impeded or uh, and resulted in myopic uh, sort of focus really on power powered mediation rather than finding these opportunities to engage at the lower levels and at the sort of national levels, which is something we've sought, sought to address. I know I've been speaking very quickly, but I was trying to really pack in as much as possible. I look forward to some of the discussion coming up. Over to you, Ginevra. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kunia, for this uh, excellent presentation, reminding us about uh, the centrality of the prevention agenda uh, of the UN Secretary General, and also, um, uh, again, recalling the importance of uh, integrated analysis, uh, not just within the, the UN House, but working with partners to integrate uh, uh, the climate uh, sensitive concerns uh, across uh, all of our political work and the mediation work. Um, I also uh, liked how uh, you did uh, indeed, um, like Julie, you were hacking Julie um, in uh, drawing attention to the potential that uh, peace mediation processes offer to um, uh, and sorry, including climate uh, um, clim a con a concern for climate uh, uh, related uh, uh, risks into mediation processes. Um, the opportunities that they offer to to to, to further uh, those processes, but as well, uh, I liked how you also reminded us of, of the challenges that we are facing uh, at the current moment. Um, so now I would like to uh, invite uh, Gideon to to share his presentation. Uh, I know that uh, he's been framing his presentation along the line of uh, of Kulmia and Julie presentation in that. Uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, um, he's the director of EcoPeace, uh, and uh, uh, in his work, uh, um, to my understanding, he tries to further um, uh, um, uh, peace processes through uh, uh, concern from uh, for climate-related risks. So, Gideon, uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the um, opportunity uh, to present here in this esteemed um, uh, event and uh, and uh, I'm very delighted to follow um, the important words that both Julie and uh, Kulmia um, have uh, have outlined, and I think that I'll I'll very much be building on um, many of the examples that uh, that that, that uh, many of the statements that they have made um, from a, a practitioner's perspective. Um, Ecopeace Middle East is a unique organization that is. Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli together. It's a civil society organization of environmentalists focused both on uh, uh, the climate crisis we face, but also uh, on, on peacemaking. Um, with 25 years of on the ground experience from our offices in Amman, in Ramallah, and in Tel Aviv. So let me um, uh, quickly share my presentation. And I, for some reason, opened up not at the right page. So let me go back. Are you seeing the presentation? Not yet. Not yet. No. Not yet, yeah. Again. Yeah, now we can. Okay. Very good. So, um, if 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 we look at the uh, at the MENA region, 
um, uh, uh, here in the in the uh, 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 the slide to the left, uh, we see that um, we are the most uh, water scarce part of the world, uh, where water insecurity sadly uh, reigns. Um, we're also a a very conflict prone part of the world. We have uh, ongoing conflicts. Um, not all of them, of course, water instigated, but many of them have water scarcity as an underlying factor. Um, the IPCC has identified the MENA region as a hotspot. And what does that mean? Uh, while you know, much of the world is worried about a one and a half to two degree uh, increase in temperatures, we're already experiencing um, a one and a half to two degree increase. And we're very concerned about a four degree uh, increase in temperature because of the climate uh, crisis. And we're already experiencing dramatic reduction in precipitation. I said we're, we're already the most water scarce part of the world. And uh, uh, areas of uh, the MENA, um, and particularly for uh, the three countries that I work in, uh, for Jordan, um, the predictions speak to a 40% decline in precipitation by the end of the century. Um, uh, uh, this is a photo uh, that I took from a, a hotel in Amman um, uh, in Jordan. Uh, water uh, throughout uh, uh, the region um, is uh, supplied um, in an intermittent fashion um, where every uh, roof has a canister that uh, stores water. Municipalities provide water um, uh, in Jordan. Uh, it can be as little as once every two weeks in Palestine. It can be once every three months. Um, uh, the photo below is one of the refugee camps uh, in Jordan, right on the border with Syria. And it, re it reflects um, uh, uh, unofficial figures of, of over one and a half million Syrian refugees crossing from Syria to Jordan with um, of course, uh, some of the underlying reasons of the Syrian uprising being climate change, uh, but then having direct implications on water scarcity in Jordan, uh, because with the addition of the uh, Syrian refugees, Amman, the capital, um, uh, used to have uh, water supplied two days every week, um, but with climate change and the combination of the Syrian refugees, which is partly fueled by climate change, uh, Amman is receiving water only for eight hours a week presently. So a dramatic impact uh, because of climate change. But as uh, we heard uh, from the, our earlier speakers, um, uh, while the threat multiplier of climate change is very evident, the other side of the coin is that climate change is also can be a multiplier of opportunity. And that's been very much the focus of the work of Ecopeace in, uh, uh, in our work, uh, because of course, climate change doesn't automatically lead uh, to uh, increased hostilities and conflict. It's very much dependent on the adaptive capacity. And if we can increase the adaptive capacity um, of countries and of regions, and, and one of the messages that that we bring forth at Ecopeace is not enough uh, to secure the adaptive capacity of your own country. As the Jordan Syria example shows, uh, the implications of a low adaptive capacity on your neighbor will have direct uh, implications for yourself um, with, with the refugee crisis crossing over to Jordan. So um, uh, uh, at Ecopeace, we've seen uh, the climate crisis as a multiplier of opportunities, we refuse to accept uh, 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 the negativity of the situation. And given the, uh, the water scarcity faced uh, uh, region wide, and, and really taking from some of the words here that, that, uh, uh, that uh, Kulmia um, uh, stated earlier, um, uh, uh, investing and looking at what types of technology and how we can uh, incorporate the private sector, given the fact that our national governments um, are in such high levels of hostility um, uh, between them, uh, that, that we undertook a, uh, a pre-feasibility st uh, study funded by the 
German government through the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, that, that has tried to uh, uh, understand the feasibility of, of creating a water energy exchange. And um, uh, that water energy exchange is, is based on uh, the uh, development of, uh, of technology. So on the Mediterranean coast, um, Israel is, is uh, presently a world leader in desalinating uh, seawater, uh, utilizing reverse osmosis technology, uh, where the cost of desalination has plummeted because of that technology from $2 a cubic meter uh, 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 less than uh, 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 12 years ago to under 50 cents at present. And uh, while Israel has already five large desalination plants, in fact, five of the 10 largest in the world, Palestine also shares that same comparative advantage uh, with the Gaza coast being on the Mediterranean. And as we'll see in a minute, the possibility there to desalinate at large scale to deal uh, with uh, the water scarcity um, that is increasing um, that exists partly, uh, of course, because of conflict directly, but is increasing because of climate change. Um, but one of the, uh, uh, the underlying problems with desalination is that at present, it's heavily dependent on burning more fossil fuels. And therefore, uh, we looked at uh, what might be uh, the uh, possibility to introduce large scale renewable energy, but not necessarily from Israel or Palestine, but in this case from Jordan. Uh, because Jordan, uh, on, on the right with its vast desert areas, in fact, has the comparative advantage over uh, Israel and Palestine um, uh, to build, to invest in large uh, uh, solar fields that can produce uh, renewal, renewable energy at very attractive prices and then sell uh, uh, solar electricity uh, across to uh, Israel and Palestine for, for general needs, but also for desalination. And in that way, uh, the, the program that uh, we've devised here and, and our study uh, comes and concludes that we're able to obtain water security. We're able to, to, to move from a situation of water insecurity uh, for all three countries to shared water security um, uh, for Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Um, uh, we're able to uh, move uh, from uh, utilizing fossil fuels to utilizing renewable energy and, and therefore putting into place uh, climate uh, mitigation directly uh, by Jordan becoming uh, the exporter of large scale energy, not only to meet her own needs, but, also, but of course uh, uh, for uh, the neighboring countries. And the attractiveness of, of this proposal um, is that it is potentially private sector led on both sides because in fact, uh, renewable energy today, again, because of uh, the development of the technology and China's uh, uh, entrance into uh, the technological uh, field has meant that the cost of renewable energy and particularly PV in our part of the world is in fact cheaper than any other uh, fossil alternative. So um, we're no longer doing a favor to anyone by uh, advocating for renewables, it actually makes the best economic sense. And, and in that way, uh, we're able to uh, promote uh, the exchange um, uh, that uh, we've, we've currently outlined. Now, this is not just uh, theory. Um, there's in fact investments taking place on the ground. So Jordan is already uh, the regional leader and it will reach some 25% uh, of its electricity being uh, renewable uh, by uh, uh, 2025, um, and Jordan has expressed its interest to export uh, electricity to its neighbors. And in fact, there does exist a, uh, 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 a transmission line connecting Jordan with Palestine in Jericho that, uh, that both Palestine and Jordan um, uh, seek to uh, increase. Um, on the water side, um, there, there, there uh, does already exist water exchange um, whereas part of the Israel-Jordan peace treaty, uh, water is being supplied from the Sea of Galilee with a pipeline across the border to Jordan and then making its way to Amman, Jordan. But there's further investments um, already being laid. 
This is the national water carrier that was built in the 50s and 60s in Israel, moving water out of the Sea of Galilee and bringing it to the center and to the south of the country. Well, because of climate change, um, uh, the uh, uh, water carrier is actually being reversed and the desalination plants existing and what we hope in the future, perhaps also connected to Gaza, will be able to move water to the Sea of Galilee. This is a billion shekel investment currently taking place um, with the idea not only to protect the Sea of Galilee from climate change, but um, uh, to enable Mediterranean desalinated water with the intention of, of its source being, uh, being solar energy, um, uh, increasing uh, water uh, security um, uh, also for Jordan. And of course the desalination uh, in Palestine uh, uh, relieving some of the water crisis also in Gaza, so that we're able to obtain water security, energy security, uh, interdependencies uh, between our three countries, which are critical, of course, to peacemaking. Um, uh, when every side has something to sell and every side has something to buy, then uh, uh, we see uh, the foundations for, for much greater stability, and we haven't, of course, taken this out of, from thin air. Uh, the coal and steel arrangement of Europe after World War II was, almost, was also focused on uh, creating uh, 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 interdependencies between former enemies, particularly Germany and France. And this concept um, of last century coal and steel is relevant this century uh, uh, to meet the climate crisis by um, as our example has shown by harnessing uh, uh, the sun and the sea uh, to bring about this inter interdependency. And by expanding uh, the water pie, we also very much focus on water justice issues for Palestine so that Palestinians can also receive a fair share of their natural, uh, of the natural water shared between Israel and Palestine. So that, that's also very much incorporated into uh, the thinking here. Um, I want to uh, leave the opportunity for, for, for much discussion and questions and answers. So, so let me uh, send the, back, send the, uh, the floor back uh, for uh, discussion time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yinan. Um, it was a really, really, really uh, interesting presentation. And I also, um, what I really liked is the fact that, uh, you know, climate, uh, the climate crisis and climate change is often referred to as a threat multiplier, whereas you're referred to as a multiplier of opportunity. And, uh, and really what we can pick up from your presentations is how, um, if we look at comparative advantage, uh, at, at uh, um, interdependency, um, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but more original integration, which is what was used in the past to, uh, you know, lift uh, you know, a certain part of the world from, from the scourge of war can also be replicated under different circumstances, of course, in other parts of the world, and also taking into account uh, uh, climate risks and the climate uh, uh, change dimension. So thank you so much for that. Um, I've seen uh, a few questions in the, um, uh, I've seen one question from Oli uh, in our chat um, and uh, I haven't seen any raised hands, but anyways, I will read the question from Oli. He addressed it to Kulmia, but uh, I invite all of the panelists to turn on their cameras and, and wave their hands if they feel they have anything to chip in. Um, so Oli's question is, are you finding that increased rhetoric on environmental issues in conflict at the global level is actually translated into a tangible increase in the willingness of protagonists to talk about environmental challenges? Uh, Kulmia, I guess the question was posed to you first. Good luck with that. And then uh, over to the other panelists if they want. Also, if, if um, oh, there's also a question from Oli to Gideon, which I will read afterwards. But if there's any other participants who want to raise their hands, um, or, or ask more questions through the chat box, please um, just let me know. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Geneva, and thank you to, to my friend, uh, Oli. Um, I think I, I accept the challenge I think Oli is asking. He's, uh, he's asking us really, is there a movement from the rhetorics to really concrete actions on the ground? And I, I, I'm an optimist. I believe so in a number of ways. I think, first of all, the, the, we've agreed the conceptual framework around 
these issues, I think, have been largely agreed by them. They've been well litigated, and I think they're agreed. I think the marching call that we've had, for example, so, so the first one is at the UN level, increase the, the, the importance of incorporating environmental issues in planning processes. Uh, in, in, uh, it means also about delivery. It also means about results being result focused. The fact that I was pointing out the Security Council and other mentions the resolutions on the new missions that are also um, highlighting these issues is important because it also concretizes and gives us a mandate to also work on some of these issues on the ground in ways that we haven't been before, perhaps because there hasn't been a political convergence on some of these issues. Secondly, regional organizations are much more increasingly um, engaging on these issues and much more vocal about these issues, which is, I think, very important, including, you know, ECO, uh, ECOWAS and African Union and others who are, who are taking, so, uh, being much more sort of vocal on these issues. Um, member states, I think there's a realization, and I think the pandemic has also, in a way, heightened those uh, vulnerabilities and security, peace and security concerns that have been pre-existing in those societies. And they, for example, in, in the Horn of Africa, we're seeing the locust issues, we're seeing the drought issues, we're seeing the famine issues, and member states are, know that for their political survival that these issues have to be dealt with at a, as, a, as, a, as a matter of priority. I think at the fourth level, we mustn't forget the role of the civil society and really general, the general population. There's a role for continuous, in a way, uh, agitation there. There's a role for continuous, in a way, uh, holding uh, the, the leadership feet to the fire and also really trying to ensure that these issues are dealt with at a community level so it does not become sort of abstractions uh, as part of why the developmental goals, but really lived experiences. Thank you very much, Kurnia. Um, Lilian Julie, would you like to complement uh, what uh, Kurnia has just been saying? I, I have some other questions below, so I'll, I'll answer those. Sure, thank you. Um, let me read it first. So the, there is a question from uh, Gideon, from Oli to Gideon. The prospect of building water and energy interdependencies among Palestine, Israel, and Jordan is really interesting. But how does one guard against those same interdependencies being used as levers of influence in future and fears among those who need to agree to it that they will be used in this way? And then if you don't mind, Gideon, I will read uh, the, the following question from uh, Moses Rundial. Um, he says, I appreciate your presentation, a question regarding water scarcity. With the current ongoing pandemic, which has crippled our lives in a way or another, has there been an, a, a, a severe impact in our ecosystem in terms of water scarcity? Over. So, so two very, um, two, two really good questions. And I think that um, the, the opportunity that, that climate change does present uh, in, in, in at least the setting that, 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 that we've uh, described here is to create interdependency. The concern I think that, that, that Ali speaks to is that you know, no side wants to be dependent uh, on the other, particularly when they see the other as the enemy. Uh, they, there's no trust. Um, and there, and, and you know, we've, we've seen um, uh, that the Jordan, for instance, uh, was very reluctant uh, to move forward on purchasing uh, natural gas uh, from Israel out of uh, the concern that Israel would then dominate. Um, uh, the Mediterranean is the cheapest source of additional water uh, for the region. Uh, desalinating uh, is, is, is the cheapest marginal cost of additional water. Yet um, uh, we do see reluctance uh, on the part of Jordan to buy uh, additional water from the Mediterranean out of concern from of domination. And I, I think that's a very legitimate concern. And on the case of Israel, um, we've also heard uh, that, that you know, uh, the government of Israel is fearful of, of purchasing uh, renewable energy from Jordan, uh, having had a bad experience with Egypt, where uh, uh, pipelines were bombed, and, and then there was real shortage of, uh, uh, of electricity as a result. Um, but but when, you, when we create interdependency, where every side, where Palestine and Israel have the ability to sell uh, uh, water and Jordan has the uh, ability to sell renewable uh, energy, something of real value, that each side has their hand on the tap, um, then that's where healthy interdependency and, and what we're seeing. So 
uh, we've actually uh, received uh, just uh, in these last uh, six weeks, a letter of support uh, for this project um, from the Israeli Minister of Energy. Um, and, you know, it, and, and you can see the fear, it's just support for a pilot. Um, but that's because of a growing, you know, there's no generosity here. That's because of a growing understanding um, that uh, Israel won't be able to meet its Paris commitments um, uh, if it doesn't uh, purchase electricity uh, from one of its neighbors, uh, renewable uh, uh, electricity from one of its neighbors, either Jordan or Egypt. So, so, so we see the climate crisis um, uh, creating a momentum uh, that, that otherwise uh, uh, wouldn't have happened because there is a fear and, uh, and, and we certainly uh, uh, portray the lessons of the Syrian uprising um, and its consequences uh, on uh, Syria's various neighbors as a lesson that we must learn. Otherwise, we're gonna see additional uh, violence, additional failed states that has implications for the neighborhood as a whole. And of course, you know, this is really important for Europe because you know, the neighborhood doesn't just stop in the Middle East and, and you see millions of refugees uh, going on to Europe. Um, on the COVID uh, issue, I think COVID um, is indeed a really important uh, wake up call for many reasons. Firstly, it's a wake up call because science matters. Science of COVID matters, science of climate change matters. And those that deny the science, deny it at the risk of their populations, the very survival of their peoples and their populations. Um, under the COVID crisis um, in, uh, in Palestine and in Jordan, um, uh, where water is intermittently supplied, um, uh, uh, there is a risk to, uh, to hygiene. You know, uh, COVID is spread because of an inability um, to deal with uh, basic hygiene. And, and when water is only intermittently supplied, um, uh, then, then what we've tried to portray to the government of Israel, for instance, um, uh, which uh, is a game changer because of its investments in desalination, um, that it has a self-interest to make sure that uh, uh, there is increased water supply to Palestinian homes, and uh, uh, and if if Jordan uh, requested to sell additional water to Jordan, it's not a matter of generosity. It's a matter of self-interest. That if uh, COVID is not controlled, not only in Israel but also um, uh, uh, not controlled in Palestine or in Jordan, then we remain all at risk. And that's, of course, the same message also from climate change. Uh, thank you very much, Yudan. Uh, uh, Kumia Juli, uh, would you like to, to jump on? Sure. Uh, th thank you, Geneva. Uh, just to really pick up uh, Gideon, Gideon's point, it really is absolutely, I think those interdependencies really also are creating uh, the, the conversation around mutual shared benefits. And I think we should also really be focusing on where we have those positive examples. If you look in uh, sort of West Africa and Central Africa, you, you have the whole cooperative arrangements uh, led by Senegal uh, as part of the, uh, you know, and others, uh, well, the Lake Chad Basin Commission. We've seen those cooperative arrangements uh, in, in Central Asia, uh, where, where, where the, the countries are really coming up with cooperative frameworks that really govern their, their, their daily use. And as far back as history, going back to the Indus uh, treaties and whatnot. But I think I also want to play devil's advocate because I think the interdependencies that are creating levels of influence, I'll take that as a mediator. Because in fact, often in the context of mediation, what you have are parties negotiating at the level of positions. And I think really to get to what we really, when we often the deadlocks are really broken at the level of need. So those interdependencies create needs and therefore create opportunities for a mediator to be able to then really break some of those deadlocks and move uh, the parties forward. Thank you, Kunia. Julie, would you like to jump on to, to anything to what Kunia just said? Comments. Let me check if there's any other questions. Um, I guess there's a reaction from, from Oli to, to, to Eden. Um, I think um, unless there is another um, round of comments from the panelists, I think this uh, you know brings us to a um, oh there's one last question which we received from um, Clement. Uh, Clement's question is to, to for all the panelists. 
what is the best case study where knowledge about the climate by policymakers enable a peaceful solution? Um, I don't know if Julie or Kimi or Bidon wants to, to comment on that. Sure, thank you, Clement. I, 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 can, I can give you a very small example uh, in the work that, for example, is being done by a mission in South Sudan. As you know, the South Sudan uh, undergoing a civil war for, for many years and after going through a transition period. And often what you have is an interplay and an inter, inter sort of uh, relationship between a le different levels of conflict at the, at the regional level, at the national level, and then at the subnational level. There has been focus, for example, on the whole issue of uh, migration, pastoralist migration patterns, which have been really traditional patterns of movement between populations in former in Sudan and, 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 and South Sudan. So what the mission, and we've seen increasingly as a result of increasing desertification and other sort of challenges, uh, more competition around those grazing routes and so forth, and therefore an uptick in, in conflicts and local conflicts. What we did and what the mission has done to work on is really to establish a migration framework patterns that then allowed there to be a negotiation and a facilitation of dialogue between the communities at the local level. They established these mechanisms and then these mechanisms really became trust building exercises, which really diminished the potential for conflict at the ground level. But also importantly, they started being helping in a way litigating and including the implementation of the wider peace agreement at the national level, because often you have a disconnect between uh, national processes and peace at the subnational level. So in a very small sense, uh, I think the, the, that sort of migration work in southern Sudan was a useful example of that. Thank you, Kulmia. Anything from Julie or Kidan? Yeah, Julie. Yes, thank you. Just, just something I might, I, I might, I might add to that is that, I mean, people, people living and and responding to these issues have have a lot of knowledge about how to how to address them as well. Indigenous knowledge will be extremely important in, in addressing some of these natural natural environmental challenges. So even if it's not coming from from a policy perspective, it's a lived reality for people trying to protect the, the environment. Um, and doing so, it's just just wanted to add that. Thank you very much. Any any other reaction on this question? So so from for me, I I just like to add that. Um, you know, solutions are very context specific. And, you know, there is, there is no single solution that you can apply uh, automatically. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that you can't adapt um, uh, these solutions to the circumstances uh, where they're relevant in different parts of the world. So I think the model um, uh, that, that, that we've presented, is, which is really the model that, create, that created the European Union, um, but, but rather last century's critical resources of coal and steel, which were focused on this century's critical resources for the Levant, which is harnessing the sun and the sea. Um, it's also an example of a relationship of coastal countries and hinterland countries in a, uh, a semi-arid or desert part of the world where they can work together. Um, and I, I think the critical aspect here in the midst of conflict is that there are often very few entry points. There are very few opportunities to try to bring uh, the conflicting parties together. And climate change, the threat of, uh, of climate change and its impacts on, on, and certainly on our part of the world on water, on water scarcity presents that opportunity. So, so you know, uh, solutions need to be, um, and, and the narrative around building those solutions need to be very, very, very local. And I also take, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 the statement earlier of, of, of uh, Kulmiya um, that, that, that we don't, that we shouldn't always try to look for, you know, uh, the ultimate solution that solves everything. And that the trust building and utilizing uh, the climate crisis as a means. So the climate crisis is generally not the source of the conflict between the parties, but by using the common uh, concern and the common threat of the climate crisis um, to build a response that builds trust, that, that perhaps also, you know, to Ollie's further question, and um, that could then also build some institutions that bring the, the sides together 
And that then uh, helps us to move forward on, on the other uh, uh, critical conflict issues that are, are clearly not a direct cause of climate change. Thank you very much. This was a really useful compliment. Um, perhaps we can take one last question, if you agree. Um, and, uh, and I think that... Is a question from Moses? Yes, please. Um, thank you, uh, Moses, for your question, where you ask, is climate diplomacy really an effective tool for spreading climate awareness? I think in many ways the answer is yes. I think advocacy is an absolutely critical tool, and we've seen how, from if you you know take the meta conversations around Greta Thunberg or the Secretary General, you know, and scoring these issues in the Security Council and other spheres, but really it has. But the importance, really, the issue and advocacy does have a place. But it's about, and this goes back to uh, the question about earlier, earlier on, but it's about how do we then utilize and capitalize on those opportunities for advocacy and climate awareness and understanding into their concrete deliverables. And I think there are four things really to take away as we, as, we, as, we, as we wrap up. I think really the opportunity is to use this advocacy and this understanding to really change the regional narratives and the narratives around some of these issues, but really about around competition, but it's also really about you know, stressing the importance of shared analysis. Secondly, it's really about using that analysis to really have diagnostic sort of strategic act, action. So it isn't for the, the, the opportunity of only creating analysis, but really informing activities that then really change what is happening on the ground. The third is to really look at, to, to, to litigate and reflect on what new architecture we need. What is, this, are the, is the current architecture we have sufficient to address the needs that we have and the type of uh, opportunities that exist on the ground. But really fourthly, is about ensuring sustained political pressure and political engagement because beyond advocacy, it's really about sustained political engagement and really then delivery on the ground. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you so much, Kulmir. Uh, I don't know if Stephen or Julie have other comments on that. No, okay, so that uh, brings us to a closing. For me, this was extremely, uh, extremely useful summary because in a nutshell, um, you know, we had a, a series of four webinars, starting from uh, a webinar focusing on uh, um, data analytics and climate security, but really uh, the different uh, panelists uh, were driving the attention to the fact that we need to work together to identify the right questions to solve this crisis um, and uh, to, 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 to ensure that uh, climate sensitive concerns are included in sustaining peace work. Um, and then we moved on and we focus on gender and climate security, uh, basically highlighting how uh, climate uh, related risks can uh, increase vulnerabilities of certain uh, groups uh, and, and categories of, of people and communities. Um, and then uh, we moved on into a webinar on, on um, climate security and migration and displacement where we also uh, tackled questions related to uh, um, you know, integrated analysis, the need to work together to build shared narratives, but also the need for action. The uh, theme of optimism versus pessimism was also running very high along the, the four different webinars. And I'm very happy to, 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 to see how we started from a very uh, sort of pessimistic approach to a sort of more optimistic uh, uh, and pragmatic uh, take on this issue, which uh, I hope also is very well transmitted to uh, our participants in whatever work they will take they're taking forward. Um, and of course, uh, the final point that uh, Kulmia, you mentioned, but uh, all of you, uh, Gideon and also Julie, and it is uh, very much reflected in the report. Um, yes, we need to work together. We need to ask questions, uh, the right questions, and to build a narrative and to come up with a plan. But ultimately, also, there is a need for serious and sound leadership. There's a need to, to, to show courage to take uh, uh, political action at the highest level as well as at the local level. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of our panelists today, but also on, uh, from the previous panels. Uh, and the, the webinars uh, and our colleagues from Adelphi, but also the climate security mechanism has been supporting also the preparations of this, uh, this series. Um, 
last but not least, uh, the UN staff college is working together with the Delphi to uh, put together um, a climate sensitive uh, programming training, uh, which will uh, start in uh, online virtual training given the current situation, which will start on 16 of November. Please do check our website if you're interested. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this, this presentation. I certainly did. All the very best to you in all your future endeavors. Take care.